a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger, an assessor of Satan to buffet me. So now as we go and preach the revelations of day three, there's this thorn in our flesh that walks behind us. These false apostles who always want to assess what we're saying. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is interesting to see that we live in a day and age where we are asked to discern and even to look at specific ways of interpreting scripture through spiritual experiences. And, you know, this is nothing new to church history. We know very early on in the church history that the Montanists basically proclaimed that there were specific prophets that spoke for God and they were only seen as the authoritative voice for new revelation. But when we look at specifically this cult and specifically what Zandra is asking for us to believe, I want us to look at the means of interpretation and how they derive their way of thinking. This is very important for us because when we come to an understanding of how we need to attune ourselves to the Word of God, there are certain principles that we should consider whenever we read a text. And I just want us to reflect on this. And then we're going to see how this turns quickly to make a point into what is called ad hominem, meaning that you have to attack an individual or a person to make a point, to make it sound more spiritual. There's also another fallacy that is prevalent within this cult's mindset. In other words, they set up a straw man argument. They set up stuff that they break down, which has got nothing to do with the original argument. Uh, we can see this quite clearly uh, in the investigation of the scripture and also of the evaluation of myself. But let us have a look and let's just work through it systematically. I want us to stick to the point and we will look at all these points uh, in sequence. But let us have a look uh, at the way these guys interpret the text. But you understand that. Why? Because the veil has been removed for you. You judge according to the spirit. The Bible says the spiritual man can judge all things, but he himself is rightly judged by no one. No one can rightly judge him. I mean, John the Baptist didn't rightly judge Jesus, although he prophesied and said, that is the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. I mean, think about it. And it, and it should have been easy for him to follow because it was his cousin. But because we're carnally minded, we don't want to follow our cousins. I mean, think how stupid it is that the scripture says that a prophet is not known in his home country. Why not? It should have been the other way around. Especially in your home country, a prophet should have been known. Because they knew him according to the flesh and how he changed according to the spirit. Why is religion making everything the other, other way around? It should not be that way. But unfortunately, it is. Yes, unfortunately, it is. Unfortunately, because we knew someone according to the flesh, it's difficult for us to know him according to the Spirit. But it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't we should be that not way. Look, we should look past Jesus and see Jesus Christ. Yes? We look past Angus and we see what it means, what is happening right now. We look past Bloemfontein. We look past the whirlwind to see Elijah and Elisha. But these signs are there for us. So that... God can prove what we're saying. It's happening. Otherwise, you just have to take it by faith, and that's sometimes difficult. So God follows it up with signs and wonders and miracles. Are you with me? So, so but, it, but why is it then more difficult? Because of religion. Because of the fact that we not, we're not taught. The moment we were born again, we should have been taught how to discern spiritually, not carnally. We are asked once more to use a central means of interpreting scripture. And that central means is basically to take uh, uh, Zandre's sort of interpretation of the text sort of at face value and to deem that necessary to actually look at the text. Everything is purely allegory. Uh, when we look at their means of interpreting scripture, they read themselves into the scripture. Uh, Zandre speaks of himself as being that central sort of pericope when we read and understand scripture. Uh, and... I'm reminded of uh, sort of the founder of the Bible Research Society, a quote that he gave. His name is David Cooper. Uh, he says the following, and I want to read this to you. He says, if plain sense make good sense, seek no other sense, or it will result in nonsense. This is exactly what we see. We are seeing that we are asked to interpret the text purely as it applies to Zandre and only to him. Uh, and that is just striking to me. And I just quickly want to give you a few principles that will help you to understand and how to interpret the text. The very first thing that you need to understand when you, under, when you understand and look at the biblical text, you need to read it in its own setting. You need to look at what is called the literal principle. 
Uh, what is the text saying in pure sight? What is the normal meaning of specific words? What do we look at when we look at figures of speech and symbolisms and allegory and even metaphor? In other words, what do we see when we allow the scriptures to speak for itself? Uh, the literal sense is the obvious meaning. Secondly, we need to look at the historical principle. The Bible must be understood in its historical setting, uh, and it would be helpful for us to investigate specifically what we understand and deduce specifically in its own contemporary setting. What can we learn about uh, what is mentioned and said about the political background, about the religious milieu, uh, and all these things historically? Number three, we need to look at the contextual principle. Uh, I like it, and I say it, and this is what David Cooper speaks of. It, it is simply... Text without context is pretext. Uh, we should interpret a specific verse by the surrounding context or the surrounding verses that are mentioned surrounding it. Uh, and let me just give you an example and let me just pause here for a moment. Uh, when Zandre speaks specifically about this spiritual interpretation of the text, I want you to look at this because he uses 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15. But let me start off as sort of a surrounding and sort of a basis for our interpretation and give you the full uh, sort of scope of what is mentioned here. And then let me give you the results. When we look at the contextual principle, Paul speaks here and he starts off with this proclamation. When I came to you, brothers, announcing the testimony of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or with wisdom. For I determined to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That is the essential foundation of this text. And I was with you in weakness and much fear and trembling. My speech and my proclamation was not with the persuasive words of wisdom, but with demonstration of spirit and power. And we can look at that spirit and power. It's the power to expose sin and the power to exalt Christ according to the context. And then he immediately goes into spiritual wisdom. And he shows us that those who are immature, those who are in the world, cannot discern the wisdom of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. For them, it's simply foolishness. The cross is an offense. The cross is foolish to those of undiscerning minds. Uh, and, and then he says the following in verse 10. He says, But now God has revealed them to us by the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything and even the deep things of God, the Holy Spirit of God, which is incredible. For who amongst men uh, knows the concerns of men except the Spirit of, uh, of the man that is within? In the same one, no one knows the concerns of God except the Spirit of God. And then listen, I just want to skip over a few verses. Verse 15 says, The spiritual person, however, evaluates everything. Uh, in fact, the NLT say, uh, uh, says uh, that those who are spiritual can evaluate all things. So we've, and we're going to see in this clip, uh, Zandre basically says, Who can judge us? How can you judge? Well, the spiritual man discerns everything. He doesn't just swallow it whole. He looks at everything. Yet himself cannot be evaluated by everyone. For who has known the Lord's mind that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What is that mind of Christ? It's not to speak an allegory. It's not to speak scripturally out of its context. It is purely to discern biblically. It is purely to look at the context of scripture and to evaluate it according to its own standard of interpretation. Are we called to look at scripture uh, uh, through the lens of scripture itself? You bet your life we are. Number four, another principle of scripture is the compatibility principle. Uh, a year we can look at other verses or other scriptures th that are relating to each other as the passage is synchronizing itself with the whole of the biblical text. Uh, we look, therefore, uh, at sort of the coherent symmetry that is evident within sort of the principal thought of a principle in the text. And we look at this text or this principle and we interpret scripture by evaluating this. Lastly, we've got what is called the grammatical principle. And the grammatical principle uh, is, uh, has uh, got to do with the sentence or specifically a sentence uh, structure. Uh, and we recognize parts of speech and the way they relate to each other uh, and how it can reveal sort of biblical truths in the context of the biblical text to one another. And then lastly, and this is so important, and it's not lost as sort of a, uh, a sort of the essential role of our interpretation, but it is because it affirms exactly what Zandre has just been violated when it speaks in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. When Paul speaks, he shows us the central sort of 
principle of biblical interpretation. And I want to read this to you again. For I determined to know nothing except, you, uh, except Jesus Christ and He crucified. The last and central principle of any good Bible exegete is the Christological principle. Jesus Christ is the main theme of the entire Bible. And we are cautioned to, to, to look and to measure everything in Scripture through Christ and who He is, what He wrought. Therefore, when we look at Zandre's sort of uh, dissension that we should separate Christ from Jesus Christ, the spiritual from the carnal, it is just an absolute violation of the context of Scripture. And John chapter 15 verse 26, when it speaks about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what is the central work of the Holy Spirit within our lives? The central work, according to John chapter 15, is that the Holy Spirit will point to Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done. This is downplayed in this movement, and we can see that an individual is elevated to a status where he's given the right to speak. This should not be so. But, but, but to be able, for, for Mary to have to be able to move from loving just Jesus to loving John, she had to be spiritually minded and know that she is working with a next Jesus Christ. And, and because she looked after him, John one day, 90 years after Christ, I don't know why, how he did that because he probably became 140 or 150 he wrote things concerning the church that we now need to know. Come on. But Mary helped him because Jesus could not anymore. But friends, just as a side note, I just want you to notice once more that, you know, the statement that have been made uh, from Zandre in the previous clip is that we need to discern. And, and he says that the reason we do not see these spiritual truths is simply because uh, we're not taught to discern. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. The Church of Jesus Christ today swallows everything. We, 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 we call a mass meeting. We call people together. And then we think that is God and that is spiritual. Let me say to you, just because something sounds spiritual, just because something sounds deeply devotional, does not mean that it's actually the will of God, nor even inspired by Christ. Uh, here we see that again, Zandre is touching on, and this is something that is, that is pretty evident in this movement of Christ in the International this reality that Christ is ultimately not sufficient. Uh, here we can see again that ultimately there's a procession where Jesus is now on the cross, where he gives this Christ's uh, sort of uh, proclamation to John and to Mary, where Mary will be the ultimate one that will deem John to become the next Christ or a new Christ, a, revelate, a revelatory species uh, as this movement proclaimed. Jesus was sufficient to help John. In fact, Jesus was so sufficient that he instructed his disciples to ask everything in his name. He even promised them that he will be with them all through the ages, all through time, every single individual, because he is the omnipotent Lord. He's the omnipresent Lord. And ultimately, Jesus is sufficient. Do not fall for any theology that tries to downplay who Jesus is that would sell us the idea that Jesus is not sufficient in himself. All right, so I want to read Matthew 16 very quickly. Then the Pharisees and the Sadducees came, just like these people assessing us, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And then he said, now, now this, is, this is actually coming into fulfillment right now. This, this scripture. When it is evening, you sp the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are now coming to test the second coming of Christ. And what will they ask? A sign. Give us a sign. He says, it, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. Standing on a stage and acting. He, you're hypocritical. Because you look at things in the flesh and not in the spirit. And tonight, I'm going to help these people who assess us as well. To see what is going on in the spirit. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Pharisees and Sadducees, people who study the Bible, people who study the Bible, yes? Yes? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, if these people have been assessing from day one, they would see that the sign of Jonah is here. Yes? But because the veil is not torn, we see things differently than what they see. 
Friends, against once more, we are asked to actually account and see with spiritual eyes that, you know, this sign of Jonah will be given to them. Uh, and then he calls upon Matthew chapter 16 and he says the following. He says that the Pharisees and Sadducees came demanding a sign. Obviously, the irony escapes him that the ones looking for a sign is usually those who are carnal minded. But he demands signs, the sign of the dove, the sign of Jonah. And the sign of the fig tree. We can go on and on and on how these signs are fulfilled amongst them. Yet he says, and scripture makes it clear, that the very signs that are looked for, a, a wicked generation, Jesus says, is looking for a sign. In actual fact, Jesus says here in this portion of scripture, uh, and he speaks and he says, A wicked and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But only the sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. The sign of Jonah, what is that? In chapter 12, verse 38 to 42 of the Gospel of Matthew, let me go read to you what Jesus says is the sign of Jonah. Uh, it says the following. It says, one day some religious teachers of the law came to Jesus and said, teach us, uh, a teacher, we want to know, uh, we want us to sh you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But only the, sign I will, the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Uh, and let me just say this. This is the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah is that Jesus would prove and vindicate his preaching through his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, ultimately, the sign that Zandre is asking for us to evaluate is already culminated and fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The one that is therefore unbiblical and unscriptural is not us. Uh, uh, again, the command is made that we should discern. And let me just give you a few scriptures. Uh, uh, because uh, w when we look at his understanding specifically of what he's mentioned, he, he speaks as if one that does not make sense of the biblical context. But when we look at the biblical context, we can understand quite clearly uh, there is an accusation made. He says, for instance, that Matthew 7 is mentioned. And, and I agree. Uh, we are instructed to discern biblically. Uh, and Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 1 uh, to 6, uh, and then verse 15 to 23, cautions us not to judge hypocritically what is it what does it mean when we judge hypocritically when we judge hypocritically we basically accuse somebody of something uh, usually something sinful or vicarious in their teaching when we do it ourselves and that is what is called for in the scripture he goes into the clip where he attacks these people that evaluate him and he says they they've got a splinter in the eye because they're still in the cross and these splinters splinter everywhere and they bring dissension all over the church everywhere. Well, first of all, the Orthodox Church does not deny the essential tenets of faith. Therefore, the one that is bringing a split and the one that is bringing a dissension is you and your church, Sandre. Therefore, we should evaluate what you're saying biblically. And when we look at the biblical imperative, we can see quite clearly that, first of all, we are called to judge and discern. Let me give you a few scriptures. You can go read it in your time. 1 Timothy chapter 5, 20, 1 Corinthians 14, 29, 2 Timothy 2, verse 17, uh, verse 2, verse 18, uh, and verse 25, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Uh, verse 14 to 15, 2 Timothy 4, 3, Galatians 1, 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 to 16, etc., etc. We are trained and asked to be ones that discern between that which is good and evil, according to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. I said it in my previous clips, according to Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bereans were faithful because they went to the scriptures and, see, and sought the scriptures to see what was said if it was in fact so. I'm searching the scriptures concerning you. Sir, and I'm looking at your doctrine and I'm saying you do not measure up to the Bible and to the word of God. What you are saying is false and what you are saying is actually not correct. If I look at your teaching biblically, unfortunately, the whole of Orthodox Christianity uh, would take time and deem you to be a cult and to be a false prophet to your own people. Therefore, there is direct implications to what that being said. And if I evaluate you scripturally, you know, I can say wholeheartedly, we are called to discern, we are called to biblically interpret the text and to look at these things and say, it does not make sense. 
we therefore look at your teaching and we can say it does not make sense it's not biblical it asks for a, a, a sort of an eisegesis meaning that we need to look at something outside of the text to interpret the text predominantly your interpretation of the text and nowhere in scripture are we cautioned or say uh, or, or called for uh, to to wait for a different christ we are called to expect jesus christ in the full consumption of his return in fact when jesus ascends into heaven the angels declare that the way you've seen him ascend into heaven in that way he will return to us it's not a spiritual return as you have claimed it is definitely a physical return that we as the church of jesus christ are waiting for what a glorious hope do we have in our lord and savior jesus christ we can, you remember the sun moon and stars i spoke of we can see them and then we can sail the ship to where we need to go then other people are criticizing it because they cannot see the signs of the seasons they look at the signs of the of the of the, the face of the sky because they're carnally minded but let me read matthew 7 judge not i want to tell these assessors that you be not judged for with the judgment you judge you will be judged sir and with the measure you use jesus it will be measured back to you so there are no sons and no followers and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not consider the plank which comes from a wooden cross a plank in your own eye now i want you guys to make a note of the cross the cross or how can you say to your brother let me remove the speck from your eye and look a plank is in your own eye where do the splinters come from from the plank so the splinters in the church's eyes come from the leaders who've, who have who still have the plank in their eyes they have not passed over in the cross okay I want to just say it again. Zandre, why is it so important to know the difference between Jesus and Jesus Christ? Because it mathematically gives you the difference between your flesh and your spirit man. Not just your conscience, sir. Your spirit man. Now I want to say this. He says again, hypocrite. If you've got a plank in your eye and you keep on put if you've got planks in your eyes this the cross and you haven't passed over you put splinters in the church's eyes and now these guys are they are assessing us putting videos on youtube they are splintering the church and then listen to this hypocrite it's the same thing hypocrite first remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye do not give what is holy to the dogs nor cast your pearls before the swine. This is why God pulled. Listen to me. I want you to make a note of this. This is why God brought in the people, the Israel, the 120. Please write that down, the 120 in brackets. He brought them here. All right. Now I'm going to share this with you. Lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Ask, sir, and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you? Listen now to Neil's sermon last night. If a son asks for bread, will will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, sir, know how to give good th good gifts even to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Don't ask us. Go ask God. Therefore, whatever you, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law, for this is the law and the prophets. So, so tonight, I'm also bringing an assessment. And let me say this. Because now, listen to this. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. 13, Jesus. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Now the next scripture I'm going to read is the very scripture he started off. This person started off by assessing us. Now listen to this. Listen, and I, I don't want to expose anyone. I want to show you the signs of the season. Why was this the first one to assess us right now? Listen to this. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. 
This is what this person wrote when he started off assessing us. Now, this person's name, if you go and search it, it says a wolf. Now, please, sir, assess yourself and the plank in your eye before you come and take out the splinters in our own eyes. Friends, I just wanted to stop here because I, I, I mean, it's just absolutely ludicrous. Think about this for a moment. First of all, Zandre is sort of giving the indication that Matthew chapter 7 is speaking in its context, specifically about Christians not evaluating or judging one another. Y yet we, we can see quite clearly that even in the book of Timothy, it says that scripture is sufficient for us to correct, to interpret and for us to guide one another. Uh, and we are sort of cautioned in scripture to actually evaluate ourselves to see if we are in the faith. And we can go through the text. And again, uh, when we look at the context of Matthew chapter 7 and Luke chapter 6, we can see quite clearly that Scripture speaks of us not pointing our finger to those when we ourselves are doing something wrong or if we are not wrong in a similar way. It, it therefore speaks a bit against hypocrisy. But look at what Zandra is doing. Look at the sleight of hand that is sort of being played here. Immediately he says that, you know what? This person's name means wolf. And therefore, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. What does that have to do with anything? You know, and, and again, if, if we try to sort of allegorize everything in the text, you know, I can turn names, I can turn names of his Leermeesters and a lot of the individuals around him in such a way that, that it gives legitimacy to what I'm trying to say. What Sandra is calling for here is just absolutely ad hominem. It is absolutely just without merit. And if you do not understand what ad hominem is, it's an argument that is used for a rebuttal where you attack the character or the individual self to make a point of your own teaching. And he says, sir, look at your own teaching just by calling my name. He's not evaluated or interacted with any scripture that I've mentioned. He's not given any context. He's not written back to me. He's not given any specific verse that I've mentioned in any clip that I've made. He's just rambling and he's just trying to create, again, these straw man arguments that actually absolutely take away from the supposed legitimacy of my evaluation of him. Do you know why I say this? Do you know why I say this? Because it's time. That's what Angus said. Amen. It's time. Now listen to this. He didn't read further. Because if he listened to our words, he would see that we will, I will prove to you in the very next scriptures that we are the inwardly right people. So you find yourself in a house of Alexander, a defender of mankind. So this is what I'm doing tonight. I'm defending the mankind from the ravenous wolves. And my name says that, and his name says that. Because it just proves that the hypocrites are ravenous wolves who come in sheep clothes to take the children away from the plan of God. Now listen to this, the very next verse. Listen to this. You will know them by their fruits. Sir, please read on. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. Now, you know what the funny thing is? As we sat there, one of my Learmeisters said to me, as he drove up into the person's driveway, it was just full of thorns and thistles. Even the tires, you can ask Benny, well, they were full of thorns and thistles. Sir, please assess your own house be before you come to mine. Because when you come to mine, you will find figs and grapes. Yeah, friends, it's true. Uh, when you look and when you come into my driveway, you see... That there are little stones that we put down because we've got a problem with uh, infestation of thorns. But here's the thing. I've got a big cactus in front of the house as well. I don't know. Maybe that has also got a spiritual significance. But just think about the logic of this. He's throwing down his Bible as if he's making a biblical point. He's saying that well, just because there's thorns on your property means that there's thorns in your heart. There's thorns in your interpretation. There's no fruitfulness. Let me just first of all say, is this, I'm part of many ministries, and I'm not saying it to boast. I'm just saying that the ministries that I'm part of are incredibly fruitful. In fact, they are a little bit bigger than Christ in Me International. The churches that we have in Gauteng, the churches that we've planted, the sons that I have under me, you know, these things I'm not going to push to the forefront to legitimize my teaching. 
But what I will do is, is boast in the Lord. I'll boast in the gospel and I will say that nowhere, uh, just because he's staying uh, and he's living in probably in a very posh estate, uh, just because he's living in a place where he is actually a little bit better off uh, in his surrounding area, uh, you know, does not mean in any way or form that his teaching is biblical or that what he is saying is right. That is just absolutely buffoonish. To think that somebody would make that as a point and people would laugh and nod their heads and point their fingers to one another in laughter just shows the absolute shallowness of the way these individuals interpret the text. It is just baffling. Just wanted to show it to you and just wanted to make sure that you see this as well. You see why I say these things? I pray with all my heart that the John the Baptist, oh, this was the other supernatural thing I want to share. Do you know that this person's ministry, the name of the ministry, means from the cross to the light. He, because his house is just next to his church, and the church name, it says from the cross to the light. And I love this, because sir, sir, if you can see, you are the first one as a sign to assess how to get from the cross to the light. So you see, this is a proof to you, because the 2014 plan has started in the church. They are searching, going from the cross to the light. Let them assess. Let them assess. But let the sign be for you. Amen. All right. So next one. Sorry for laughing. I, I really am trying to take their teaching seriously. But when you look at the way and the means they interpret things, it's just, uh, just face bomb. He says that at lucem simply means from the cross to the light. It is not at all what it means. Again, at lucem is part of an apologetic ministry and a research ministry that is outside of the church context where we evaluate different sort of things around us in our area specifically we engage with muslim apologetics we look specifically at different attacks upon the church it is a sort of apologetic ministry in itself uh, it has got nothing really to do with the fellowship of the saints on a sunday in our church here in western area but let me just say at lucem simply means in latin to move towards the light um, I do not know where he gets the interpretation or even the meaning that it means from the cross to the light. Uh, it is not what it means. It is just false. It's just a lie. And again, uh, if you use something like that, it is just absolutely fickle. Zandre, please engage with the arguments. Also, I just want to say this because, you know, it is very important to do this. I've sent numerous messages to you guys. Uh, I've sent it to your uh, Facebook page. I've sent it uh, to your uh, specific Leermeester uh, that you've spoken of. Uh, and uh, look at the arguments. Read it and respond biblically. I would love for you to respond to the biblical letters that I've sent to you. Uh, also, my, in, uh, uh, my uh, uh, invitation is still open for us to come speak with you guys, to come sit with you. I always do this. I always send to anyone that I evaluate and speak of if it's possible to evaluate and look at their message, to contend with them, uh, and try to ask that we get together. Uh, we've actually asked for a, a dialogue, a discussion, uh, and it's been denounced. It is actually pushed aside because they do not believe in democracy. They do not believe in engagement because it's not biblical. I've said in this uh, letter that I've sent back to them that obviously it is biblical because we can see that we are called to contend for the faith. We are called to speak to one another. We can see it happening in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, in the first Christian council, the Jerusalem council. We can see that Christians came together and they spoke about their doctrine. You know, uh, it should be that we are open to receive mutual instruction. Unfortunately, we do not see this. What we see is somebody that has to twist something and use it to his own advantage to make a point. I pray and plead with you, if you are part of this movement and church, that you would actually open your eyes and look at the validity of the argument and realize that nothing is being said, nothing has been refuted. Hopefully, you will see the truth of this and hopefully it will bring you towards the light, which is the absolute gospel of Jesus Christ revealed in Scripture. So, I'm going to end off by saying this. The true apostles of God are the ones who have messengers of Satan walking behind them. I want to ask these people who assess us, sir, who's walking behind you? Once more, I, you know, the accusation is made. And it's easy to make a statement where you say, 
Who is persecuting you? Who is walking behind you to, to give legitimacy to what you're doing? Because if you, this is one of the criteria on how they evaluate their own doctrines. If you're not persecuted, you are not in the faith. You are not preaching the true gospel. Well, I will not go around and show you how many people have criticized what we are saying and we are doing. In actual fact, think about this, Andre. Uh, when you look at the way you actually persecute us and the way you speak out against me personally, you know, that is a persecution in itself. Does that legitimize what I'm saying? I would say no, not at all. You know, just because you've got individuals, we've got many Muslims that have criticized what we say. We've done and we've seen Muslims and people of other religious persuasions actually attack us on Facebook and say things and inboxing us, sending us nasty emails. Uh, even when we also take on these supposed prophets and people, you can just go look at our YouTube channel when we evaluate these different prophets and uh, people speaking things vicariously on scripture. What they say, certain comments, I could not even post. I could not even, I had to remove them because of the, the quality of the conversation. And, and Christians, people that call themselves Christian, swearing at us. People persecuting us for what we're saying and what we are giving out. Uh, but here's the central thing that I want, to, I want you to keep in your heart. Uh, you know, uh, that is not the standard of judging any good doctrine or theology. That is not in any way or form subtracting or adding you know, to what we are saying. Uh, it should not with you as well, Zandre, nor with your church. Um, you will be persecuted no matter what. People will disagree with you no matter what. But that is not the central way of interpreting the text. I want to remind you again where we started off when we spoke on how to discern and how to look at these different doctrines. I hope you are blessed by this. I hope if you are in this church, uh, he cautions his people not to have anything to do with anybody that speaks out against them. Obviously, there's a concern. I see uh, uh, and I also read that certain people speak to me and say that the clips have an effect. Uh, I see people um, sending me inbox messages and saying, thank God they've gone there. Uh, I'm sending uh, and have people that are saying that we need to pray for these people in the church. Uh, we need to pray for the leadership of this church. We will do so. I'm fasting currently for them. I'm praying for them. I'm not just giving a result. I'm absolutely before God saying, Lord, I pray for them. I pray that you'll bring them to an understanding of the gospel, that you'll shake them free from this deception, that they will see the foundational truth of scripture and that they will come to a fruitful understanding of the word of God. We pray for this. We pray for them. We love them. It's because we love them that we speak out against them. If we left them alone, we, we would sort of leave them in their own condemnation, but it's because we love them. And I want to say to you guys that are praying for us, for people that are sending encouraging messages, thank you that you are praying with us. Thank you that, that you are standing in faith with us. I'm praying and, and speaking and also saying to those who support us, those who are saying, thank God for these clips. Please look at all of them. Please share them. Please send them to everybody else and make sure that it goes into all the world. I hope these clips are fruitful. Uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, again, I also need to say that we make not a cent from what we are doing here. Uh, we are basically self-sufficient. We're not 80% sufficient. We are 100% sufficient on ourselves, which is a great place to be. And God is faithful. God faithfully provides for us in the church and in all the other ministries where we are involved with. Uh, and thank God for that. But please, uh, uh, just make sure that when you send this, that you also pray for the individuals that you send it to. Have a lovely day. I hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, and hopefully uh, we're back here where we look at other things as well. But have a wonderful day. And may God bless you indeed.